welcome. This is September 1st, 2020. This is the Education Committee in the Vermont House of Representatives. And we are meeting today. Our focus this week will be on basically three topics. One is the recommendation to appropriations for the governor's uh, recommended budget. Um, the other is recommendation for the use of CRF funds. And the third thing is to look at uh, miscellaneous uh, changes in statute that are related to um, the COVID-19. COVID um, so to start, we had discussed uh, in our meeting areas of issue that were of interest. We looked at um, the outright um, budget, which we'll talk about at, at the end. Um, they had asked for 60,000, um, 8% would be 55.2 and 3% would be 58.2, just to keep that in mind. The Governor's Institute of Vermont was reduced by 5,700 um, and the early literacy 79,000 uh, mystery money. And then there was, I think it was 24,000 uh, that was cut from the State Board of Education. So. We invited the chair of the State Board of Education, um, John Carroll, to come in and talk to us to respond to, to that uh, so we can determine what our recommendation will be. So with that, uh, I welcome um, Chair John Carroll to speak to the committee. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. For the record, I'm John Carroll, Chair of the State Board of Education. Um, Mr. Petty has posted um, a PDF of my remarks um, and I, I hope that's available to you. Um, it, it is, I see some heads nodding, that's good. So I'm gonna um, st st stay with my remarks if, if I may. I'm, uh, if you'll forgive me, even though I wrote them, I'm gonna read them to you. Um, so thank you for inviting me to speak to you today about the FY21 budget restatement. As a, as a matter of principle, the state board believes that we, like every other entity of state government, should step up and carry our full share of the burdens of cost containment during these trying times. Specifically, the board proposes to you today to reduce its 20, FY21 budget from 80,845, which is uh, what uh, was initially proposed, to $70,750, that's about a 12.5% reduction in our budget. Um, most of these savings, savings <clears throat> we're quite confident that we can achieve these savings largely through the reduction of reimbursement of travel costs. As, uh, as you know, uh, relying upon uh, virtual meetings as you folks are doing, uh, we do that as well. And we see that we can in the next fiscal year um, that we can r reduce our, our cost by this amount. Um, I, I do So our proposal is to reduce the state board's spending level by 12.5%. Uh, I do want to be very, very clear that this proposal by the state board is, uh, is in lieu of anything that it's not in addition to, it's in lieu of, in replacement of, uh, anything that the Secretary of Education may have proposed. Um, I, I, in fact, I want to go a little bit further and speak about the Secretary's proposal, which I think will make clear why the board um, uh, is making its own proposal here. Uh, we, we advocate, in fact, that the Secretary of Education's proposal to reduce the board's budget be rejected out of hand. He, although the secretary is a member ex officio of the state board, um, he has no authority to speak for the state board, none. The secretary acted unilaterally in proposing to reduce the board's budget by $24,000. The secretary never bothered to consult with the board about his proposal or even to inform us of his plan to reduce the board's budget by 30%. Just parenthetically, I might observe that the secretary proposes to reduce the board's budget by 30%, but to reduce his own agency's budget by 3%. Uh, the secretary states, the, the, the basis of his proposal is fundamentally flawed. He states that $20,000 
can be achieved by terminating the state board's membership in the National Association of State Boards of Education, NSBE. Uh, th this is actually a fiction. The truth is that the board last paid dues to NASBE, the National Association, in fiscal 2019 and terminated its membership more than a year ago in early fiscal 20. The board intentionally, by the way, terminated its membership in NASBE because we needed the money to pay for anticipated obligations to, uh, to retain outside legal counsel. Um, it became very clear in late uh, 2019 that the agency was very, very unresponsive to uh, the Act 173 advisory group and to the state board in the 173 rule revisions that it was proposing. And it became clear that we might need to retain counsel of our own to draft our own regulations in lieu of what was presented by the secretary and the agency. Moreover, uh, state law requires the state board to be the, uh, the setting for appeals of, the, of actions and decisions by the secretary. And in the last um, 10 months, the board has uh, heard and dealt with and paid for legal counsel for two such appeals. Um, so it's very clear that um, uh, we need funds for uh, paying for outside legal counsel, partly sometimes to uh, have the horsepower to uh, challenge the secretary and his own legal staff, and other times to uh, serve the citizens of, of Vermont as the uh, Court of, of Appeals uh, for the uh, uh, actions of the secretary. In effect, the secretary's proposal to cut $20,000 from our, well, let me back up. So the 20,000 that we figured out a year and a half ago that we could and should set aside and save by terminating our, our uh, membership in NSBE, we set aside for um, uh, legal counsel for the year and um, the agency in writing its budget never bothered to consult with us and never bothered to even think about this. And so their budget is fundamentally in error as it was presented in January and as it is now. Uh, so anyway, what, what will happen if the secretary's proposal were uh, uh, implemented is that the board's uh, ability to retain outside counsel would be um, suffocated. And uh, not only will that impair the board's ability to uh, hear appeals of the secretary's actions as required by law, but it also profoundly undermines and compromises the board's own ability to uh, challenge and to take issue with actions of the secretary when in its view, those actions are not supported by the statute. So um, in conclusion then, I, I just want to be clear that the state board does indeed is indeed prepared to carry its full share of the burden with a proposal for 12.5% uh, reduction in its budget in um, the FY21 budget restatement. Um, and uh, uh, we believe that we can do that through um, reductions in travel and other operating costs. Um, and yet at the same time, protect the board's ability to have access to legal counsel when and as needed. Uh, we already this year have um, um, uh, spent nearly $5,000 uh, in attorney fees for a case in which the secretary's action was successfully appealed um, by an independent school. So um, we look forward to carrying our, our full share of uh, the challenges that, that we face. And yet at the same time, we're determined to protect the board's own autonomy and independence as an overseer of education in Vermont. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, are there any questions? Uh, Representative Conlon. 
Thank you, Kate. Uh, just a, a couple of quick questions. Could you clarify a little bit more about the SBE budget in terms of what makes up the majority of it today? Yes, I, I, I can. Um, the big hunks are, are travel of board members to board meetings. That's intended to be, it's in the past been budgeted, I think it was budgeted for this year for $22,000. You know, we try to travel all around the state. We have 12 to 15 meetings a year. Um, and there are um, uh, 11 of us on the board. Um, but as I say, that can be significantly reduced this year anyway. It's going to come back to bite us next year when hopefully when things return to normal and we're not doing distance meetings. But we certainly have the opportunity to make big savings there. Um, there have been some other elements in the state uh, in the I should just clarify that the budget, and I hope to change this now that this has all happened, the, the budget that you see for the state board has been prepared by the agency of administration. And th they have never consulted with the state board on what's in the budget or what the amounts are, which now that I'm chair, I find really quite startling. Um, the only reason that the agency, that the board's budget is part of the agency's budget is that a historic accident. As you know, um, at one time, the board was in charge of the agency. And after 2012, we are not very definitely, and I'm very, very clear and comfortable about that. But it's sort of a historic accident that the board's budget is sort of a piece, a very dinky piece, I might say, of, of the agency's budget. So um, other major elements are per diems. That's about $10,000 a year. And so, and there was until a year and a half ago, $20,000 set aside for this membership uh, in Nesby. And we got rid of that knowing that we were seeing a lot of, a lot of issues between the board and the agency, as well as uh, appeals that, um, we, we were convinced we needed our own legal counsel um, uh, on many of these issues. So we took that $20,000 for, it was gonna be used for dues, uh, terminated our membership, and at least in our minds, applied that $20,000 to outside legal counsel as needed. And, and it's not reflected in the budget that the agency has provided to you. And if, if it will be helpful, I would prepare, I, I have prepared um, a, the board's yes, version of the budget, which is this pretty much like the agency's only $12,000, no, $10,000 less, and um, substitutes legal counsel for um, this membership that we haven't had for a couple of years. Thank you. And, and I just will say, I, I appreciate the fact that um, the board immediately stepped up with uh, in excess of the 8% or 3% that others had talked about and coming in at 12.5%. I don't know the precise answer to your question. Honestly. Representative Austin? Yes, um, I'm just curious because the process doesn't seem like a well, you know, well thought out process if you weren't consulted. You know, if it wasn't kind of a collaborative process of going back and forth in terms of, you know, your expenditures and your revenues. I'm wondering, like, historically, has this happened before? Or, you know, have you, have you, is this new? Is this a new thing that happened? Or is this the MO? Um. You know, my history at the board only goes back a couple of years, uh, but I did do a little research and saw, for example, in in uh, fiscal 2019, the board had legal expenses largely associated with uh, state plan for Act 46 of around $15,000, none of which had been budgeted. And the board went over budget that year because no one had ever apparently realized the board's going to need legal assistance. And they did under the former chair and uh, very appropriately, we retained counsel to um, help us differentiate between what the agency was advocating and what the board wanted to advocate. I mean, sometimes 
we don't see the world the same. And, um, and so we, we, but further to your question, Representative Austin, to my knowledge, there's never been a process of consultation between the agency folks who write up this budget and the, what they seem to do this year anyway was just take last year's budget and just carry it forward. Even though the secretary was present during discussions when we said, we don't want to spend any more money on, on um, uh, we've stopped spending money on memberships and we want to use all that money for legal counsel. Um, I, I hope now that this has all hit the wall, I hope that next time round we get uh, the board has a much more active role in building its budget and owning it. And frankly, I'm just astonished that the secretary who met with us all day long on, on Wednesday, the 19th of, of August, and, and his, his uh, budget document is dated the 18th, and he never even mentioned that he was going to cut us off at the knees by 30%. I mean, it was really extraordinary. And I think the board members are, are, are quite disappointed in that. Thank you. I will say having lived through the kerfuffle we had in 2019, the summer with the Act 173 um, group, the need for independent counsel became very, very clear um, yeah. when the agency had proposed had made some recommendations that we, we certainly learned were sort of um, quite far away from uh, federal intent and that came from outside counsel. So I really do appreciate the need for that counsel. So, um, and I'm just, so, so you're, you're saying you're, I mean, I, we don't have your budget, but we do have this budget um, that basically just takes last year's and reduces it by 24,000 42, is that, does that math that's, add up? That's what I, I, I understand that was the secretary's proposal. Yes. And, and, and our proposal is to reduce it um, by about $10,000, which is 12 and a half percent. Okay. I'm just trying and to find I, a way I, to If you like, I would, I would send you uh, this evening um, the sort of um, a line item budget uh, as as uh, as presented by the agency in January, and uh -huh. as we propose, it be incorporated in the restatement. Okay, um, that would be great. I, we need to sort of I need to basically respond today um, to the the uh, to the appropriations committee. I see that we don't have our our representative from appropriations in the room at the moment. Um, I'm. Yeah, Wait a minute. Oops, I see, I see a hand raising. Oh, Chip is there. Oh, good. I'm yes, sorry, you, no. you covered up by testimony. I, I, I can send uh, um, this also to Representative Conquest okay. simultaneously, if you wish. So, Chip, the, the state board has a budget that they put together that is different from this budget. And um, I, I'm inclined to, I, I'm just going to preempt this a little bit by saying um, I'm inclined to uh, allow not to accept that reduction. Um, and yet I also want to, which I want to see where the committee stands, but I, I want to be able to give you something that's more concrete in terms of the State Board of Education's recommended budget for themselves. So yeah, if, you, um, if you are the uh, chair would send that along to me, that would be, that would be helpful. Okay. Um, can I ask a, a quick question? Well, I have Please. a floor here before I, I'm going to have to duck out in a minute, I'm afraid. Um, what was the what was the rationale for choosing the 12 and a half percent, given that other well, the agency itself was reduced by three percent and and others, um, most other agencies and departments uh, had that same three percent sort of required re required by the administration reduction. Why did you all decide that 12 and a half percent was well, um, first of all, just to give you some indication of how marginalized the board is on these matters. I mean, number one, we knew nothing about the agency's proposal, the secretary's proposal until Secretary Webb alerted me to it and then you did as well. I mean, we, we were totally blindsided by all this. Um, so so um, uh, 
our approach, and so we knew nothing about 3% or 8% or any of that. We, we primarily I as chair, um, just sat down with our budget and looked at the line items and visualized the rest of this year through uh, through next to the middle of next year and um, in, in light of COVID and so forth. And um, our travel and, and most of this comes from travel um, reimbursement and the, the agency's budget was 22,790 for this year. The agency's budget for this, for the board was 22,790. And um, I'm lo I've looked at what we've spent already this year and I'm, I'm, uh, I shaved uh, nearly $8,000 out of that. And then another $1,000, $2,000 out of advertising, which we have underspent the last several years. I went back through and looked at our spending for the last several years. And so I basically just did it. Where's their softness? And I'm, I mean, I'm, I used to run a business. So I, where's, where's their softness in this budget? And I just picked out these two items and together they total about $10,000 and that, that what I didn't worry about what percent that came to. I just knew that that was money that we could say, we don't need to spend that. So that's, that's the way we were thinking about it. Great. Thank you. So your, the, the, your total budget then, do you remember what the top number was for your total budget? Well, it, it was 80,845 yeah. and we proposed that it be 70,750. Say that again. It was, but as, as initially presented by the agency in January, $80,845. Mm -hmm. and, and we propose that it be in the restatement reduced to $70,750. Okay, that helps, I think. That helped Chip to have that. And, Oops, and I, will, I will send you the line item budget. Um, if it's imperative, I can get it to you before five o'clock today. Okay, so, so Chip, if, if um, the governor's original budget was 80,845, the current one looks like it's um, 56.8 and the board is proposing 70,750. Is that uh, enough? Um, well, no, no. <laughs> what we need from you yeah. um, is is your and and to be honest, um, tomorrow uh, would be okay. Um, but what we need from you is what the the um, final budget number you're going to recommend to us for the state board. Okay. Um, you know, uh, and and I would love to have that. Um, the line item budget, but that's not necessary for okay. right now. What I really need is the, the recommendation from your committee. And like I say, if we have that um, by tomorrow, that's that's fine. Okay. Well, it sounds like we've got the number now. <laughs> okay. um, and so, so if you're going to recommend the the um, chair's proposed budget, I'll take that back. But I would love would need it in an email to me yeah. and to the committee. Well. And that's just me saying that. I'm just looking out at the committee. Are you are you comfortable with this? Or I see two hands. Excuse me. Let's let's just check in with um, Larry Coopley. You're muted. Yeah. Thank you, Kate. Um, I think it would be wise to look at the line item budget prior to making these decisions. Um, notably, it's very light in the and time here. I, I understand that. Um, but I would certainly like to look at the budget, line item budget, prior to making a decision. Okay, John, maybe you could send it to the committee. I shall. Okay. Um, and Kathleen James, did I see you? Did you have a question? No. Sarita Austin? I'm just, um, we don't need to talk about it now, but I'm just wondering what the solution is for rectifying this process, because it just doesn't seem like it's very efficient and it, it doesn't seem like it's best in terms of looking at the state budget and how things can operation. So what would you recommend, um, Mr. Carroll, for 
you know, creating a process that both you and the AOE can agree to um, in a collaborative manner. Yeah. It, you know, it, in, in fairness, I think this is, quote, the way it's always been done. And it, it, um, it sort of has worked, but these are, cha these are very different times and it doesn't seem to work anymore. I, at the moment, would say that um, my first approach would be to approach the secretary himself about this. And uh, I would think it would be apparent to the secretary that we need to improve our process and that we would do that in the next cycle, uh, i.e. in the preparation of the 2022 budget, which would be um, uh, ordinarily be happening fairly soon um, as we approach the next biennium. Uh, so it'd be my intention as uh, chair to begin that conversation. And I'd, I'd be very surprised if there was uh, objection or resistance from the agency on this. I think it's largely just been out of sight, out of mind for kind of everybody. And they you know, basically have, have been without a, you know, a, a CFO for a few months, which didn't help either. I'm sorry, Sarita, were you finished? I was just saying thank you. Okay. That sounds like a good plan. And we also anticipate taking up, we have a bill on our wall that we just didn't have time to address, the Senate sent over us, looking at some of the statutory changes that need to happen in relation to the, the State Board of Education and the change in relationship. Um, so, you know, if we're all elected, if I end up being chair, um, I will be uh, pulling that down and we'll, we'll not pulling it down, it'll be gone, but we will start that conversation again. Um, Chip Conquest, yes. Um, yeah, I'm going to just, I have to leave to go back to my committee for a second and I'm going to um, take that opportune moment to jump in where I don't belong, which is in the policy committee's world. But, uh, <laughs> It, it seems to me that based on this discussion, um, and particularly around the need for independent counsel, that if you're going to be taking up an examination of um, some of the statutory uh, authorities of the board and, and, and a sort of broader look at the board, um, a, a real examination of their budget and what they really need in order to do their job, um, the job that, that we've set out um, for them to uh, carry out their authority, that would be a really helpful thing for the appropriations committee to get your input on, you know, That's right. going forward, having had a conversation with all the players uh, involved um, and, and based on your committees, uh, thinking about what the board needs to carry out its mission, um, making a recommendation for what I would assume would be perhaps a, a somewhat larger budget in order to do that. But um, I, it would be helpful to the appropriations committee to have an informed uh, report back about budgetary recommendations. Thank you, makes sense. Well, I do have to run, um, but I yeah. hope that I will uh, have time to come back while you are still, still and we, uh, we Thanks, also have We have a committee bill that we're gonna be working on that we're hoping we can uh, just give that language to you once we kind of figure out what we're doing um, to give to you to put into the budget. Yeah, and when will that, that is something that we would like as soon as possible. I don't know yeah. when you're thinking of, do you know yeah. when, when you are likely to have that? We're gonna be taking it up today and then we'll be getting more testimony on it tomorrow. We're- Okay, and this is the one about the uh, number of days, school days? That's on the list. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that the draft is on our website right now or it's about to be filled um, Jim has sent it over to Phil, so it that should there. be up. My chair did did bring that specific um, bit of language up and asked um, me to check in with you. So I think if if we are likely to have it tomorrow afternoon, that would be great. Um, if not, could you just give me a heads up that it's still going to be Yes. Coming? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. See you soon, I hope. Join us anytime. Okay. Um, so in relation to the other issues, um, so I, I have a request for us to wait to look at, at the state board um, budget, which Madam we will get Chair, tonight. Yes. Madam Chair, I can just change my afternoon schedule and bang out a, um, a, a comparative table showing you the budget as originally proposed in January the, if you wish, the secretary's changes 
and our proposal. So question to the committee. Um, are you going to need are you going to need that to be able to decide whether you're going to support it or not? Or is it just going to be you know something that you'll be able to you know validate later? I think I would like to I think John's John's idea is good. I think I'd like to look at their line item and the agency's request as well. Peter Conlon, did you have something? Oh, I was just, you were asking for, uh, uh, you know, yeah. the fact that they've self-proposed a nearly 13% decrease in their budget makes me feel very comfortable with their proposal. So you're comfortable with the proposal and we'll get the justification later. Would it be okay with you? Yes. Larry, you want to have the justification before you decide. Any other, anyone? Anybody else? I agree with Peter. I think, you know, it was, everybody else was asked to, to reduce 3%. So they went well, well beyond that. So I, I would, I don't need to see it right now. I'd like to see it at some point, but not, bef not, not before it's due. Who needs, so you think you can get it to me by when, John? I'll get it to you. I can. I can get it to you in the next hour. I would send it Perfect. to Mr. That Petty works. As, a, as a PDF. And Great. if Mr. Petty would get it to the members and you, I, uh, yeah. I'll Thank do it. You. Let's just get we're, it done. We're meeting until three today. So if we could get it um, you know, before then, that would be great. If we could get it by 2.30, that would be ideal. Do our best. Thank Pretty you so great. much. Thank you all so much. Thank <laughs> you for giving me this opportunity to speak with you. Excellent. Um, so the other remaining issues on that list that we had talked about were um, outright. Um, we have a proposal to just give them their budget, which is 60,000. We have a proposal that says 58.2, which is a 3% reduction. And then we had a proposal to do 55.2. So I'm gonna just, who's comfortable with, um, well, let's, who's comfortable with, who, who, who is, I'm gonna start and we'll work up. Um, can you accept 55.2, which is an 8% reduction? Just raise your hands. I tell you, what, do your blue hands, that would be helpful. <laughs> I can see your Kate, that, that's the one that outright agreed to in terms of that's an 8% what, reduction, that's right? What, that's what they had been anticipating, yes. So we know. Okay. Thing. It just so that's you. I've got enough people comfortable with comfortable it, with it. Can got, you accept, or would you prefer? No. Can you accept that? Can you accept it? Okay. I am trying to raise my hand. I'm just used to. Okay. Using. Good. <laughs> okay. Good. We can do it. We can do it that way as well. So I have enough that we already know we can do a bottom. We've already got that. That's now, now I want to go up. Um, who would like it to be the full 60,000? Uh, Let's everybody, I'm going to have everybody lower your hands. And then who's prepared um, to go with 60, the 60,000? Okay, I've, I've, I've got two blue hands, which I don't think is everybody, because... Kate, I, I, just to establish the rules of voting yeah. here, we can vote twice or three times. Oh, right? you can vote, you can vote right. three times if you want, yes. <laughs> oh. Yeah. So I've got just, um, Peter and Dylan are okay so far, and, and me, I would put myself in that category, um, are okay with 60 grand. And then who would be okay with doing a 3%? Uh, Kate, this is Caleb here. I'm texting you because I'm just on the phone. Um, yeah. I am okay with 60 and I can live with 55 too. I texted you those things, sorry. Okay, great. Thank you so much. 
this is really hard to do it like this. <laughs> Let me tell you, I am struggling away here. Um, We're now raising our hand for the 3% cut, is that correct? Uh, yes, 3% cut. Why don't you just raise your hands? I've got Caleb, you're... All right, so it looks like so far, let me see again. I don't, I don't even, hey, Peter Conlon, can you straighten me out? I don't even know what question I've just asked. <laughs> it looks like the majority, Kate, is 55,000. Yeah. I, I got yeah. that. I got I that got everybody, it. no, I got that everybody agreed that they could go with that. I haven't gotten that it's clear that that's what, if there would be more that people would be willing to accept. Kathleen, All right, so let's, let's, let's do a clear and, and uh, everybody raise your real hand. Yes. If you would, if you're okay with three percent as opposed to eight percent, three percent opposed to eight percent. One, two, three. But if we prefer eight percent, are we going to vote for that, or? You already voted for it. <laughs> okay. So this is okay. <laughs> Thanks. So, so we've got. I think I think I counted seven of us that were. Uh, we're, we're okay with the three percent. I think you counted four. I saw four hands. Okay, let's put them Are down again. The... Put put them down again. <laughs> Sorry, Cooper, are you just, looking at real hands or virtual just, hands? Can I'm I just clarify? No, I'm one looking at real hands. Okay, I'm gonna do it this way. I'm just gonna go around and I'm just gonna find out where we are. Okay. So, Peter, what's your recommendation? Uh, well, I'm comfortable at any level. Uh, and, and fully supportive of any level. I'm also fully supportive of a strong recommendation coming from this committee. So if that means a strong recommendation is at 8%, then that's great. But I, I would like to see a higher amount. However, I, like I said, I think a, more important for me is a strong recommendation from the committee. Okay. Um, Kathleen. Um. Basically, I, I thought about it all weekend. And if, you know, I guess the more I thought about it, the more I felt on principle, everybody across the board is being asked to tighten their belts a little bit this year. And so I felt that no matter how important um, I feel Outright's work is, and no matter how much I support their mission, I felt that they should be asked to tighten their belts a little bit. So I would rather see um, this committee get on board with a 3% cut because that's what the Agency of Education was asking itself to do all across the board. So um, I would love to see the committee rally behind a 3% cut, which is what the agency was doing across the board. If we okay. can't get our committee to rally behind that, then I'm with Peter. I would love to see us rally behind 8% and I can live with that, which is why I raised my hand for it. Jay. So I, I guess I'm kind of a combination of what Kath just said and what Peter said. I prefer the largest reduction, but I, I am compelled by Kath's argument that if 3%, maybe, maybe I'd be okay with that. Okay. But, but the strong suggestion is uh, what we should go with. Um, Casey. I guess I'm just kind of still stuck about what because I was kind of hearing both <clears throat> um, about the federal money that came in versus what we actually allocated to them. I, I, the math, I, I was getting two conflicting stories. So I, yeah. that's why I'm, I'm leaning towards the 8% because I thought that they were originally allocated 20 and then this was a federal grant that they're trying to hold on to from the state. Is that correct? Am I wrong on, on thinking this? They had gotten 20 from the state and 40 from the feds. And then last year we gave them 60. So we gave them 60. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. But you'd let you'd say 8%? Yeah. Thanks. Um, okay, Lynn. I'm also with the 8%. That's what they had expected and had planned for, even though they didn't want to, which nobody would want to, but I'm with the 8%. Thanks. Dylan. You know, I just, I think that this is um, a real priority and these are at-risk students. And my personal preference would be that we fully fund 
at the 60,000. This is such a modest expenditure uh, compared to the others that we authorize. It's very modest in the budget and it's the only service provider providing these types of services uh, directly to schools. And the in-demand nature of the work they do to me suggests that it is a worthwhile investment. I'd be willing to accept a 3%, but 8% for me is a non-starter. Caleb. Sorry, just unmuting there. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm going to say my opinion is the same as Kathleen's. Uh, I would like us to go to to three percent. I don't mind a little cut. Um, I would like to see this committee do something unanimous. And I think that when Dana came in and told us they had prepared for fifty five two, um, they probably knew that there was a chance that's what they were going to get. Um, I think if our committee could unanimously support their work in that way, um, fifty five two is okay with me. It, if people want to go higher, I will vote for the highest number that anybody puts out there. Uh, Sarita. Can we do like 6%? <laughs> you know, we're talking about $1,000. We're not talking about a million dollars. Yeah. So the oh, difference yeah. between between that is, is, is small. Um, and we need to move on. So... I'm going to say I'm not going to recommend that at this point. Okay. <laughs> but um, that can be overruled. I'm with Kat. You know, I mean, I just, I'd like to, I'm with Dylan too. I'd love to give him the full amount. I do, do believe people are tightening their belts. And I feel like it sounds like they can run the program uh, at, a, at the 8% um, reduction. So um, I would go with that. 8%. Uh -huh. Yeah, okay. Um, Maddox, is he here? Yeah. Can you hear me? Oh, there you are. <laughs> yes. Chris? So the 8%, just because outright was comfortable with it, they were preparing for it. And, you know, after hearing from uh, State Board, we got to we gotta come up with some money here and we're going, we're going the opposite way. So the agency came up with with all these savings that they proposed and and now we don't really have anything if we give full amounts all the way around. So we gotta trim some some of the budgets here. So I think the eight percent they're they're okay with it. So the fifty five two number is good for me. And then Larry, you're at eight percent, correct? I'm at eight percent. And you know, notably our budgets uh, this the budget in particular is gonna is really being stressed at this point. And it's, you know, unfortunately, nonprofits are going to suffer from this, but, and everybody's got to go. So I, I don't know how we can do a hundred percent. And I appreciate everyone here giving their remarks. It's, uh, it's too bad we have to cut anything for anyone. However, um, the stress is there, the strain is there. We have our Vermont State Colleges. There's, there's a lot going on. And I just wanna make sure that everyone is aware that we don't have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars to spend anymore. Okay, I, what I love is that actually the difference we're talking about is $3,000, but this is what I understand. The $3,000 we're gonna to get totally stuck on, but a million we're gonna just toss off and say, sure. So I will, um, I, what I would like to do then is say that we recommend this range between the three and, three and 8%. Can we live with that? I don't actually have to take a vote. I just have to write a letter. So I'm saying, can you live with me writing it like that? Hallelujah. <laughs> but Kate, I, I think it is worth mentioning that that, yeah. that range and uh, I don't know if you'll call it unanimous or near unanimous support of the committee. Yeah. Just so well, that I, they understand that we feel strongly about, about that. I saw the eight percent, I saw when I, the heads on the people that wanted 8% were okay with me writing it as three to 8%, correct? So just to clarify, okay. does that mean that we're not making a recommendation? We are making oh. a recommendation and, and I can, I can actually, it's not even a, I don't even have to have a formal committee vote. I just have to have a general acceptance. So I don't have to purport, purport a vote. So it's okay. Moment, Oops, yeah. You're going to say a range of 3 to 
or eight yeah. percent. I was going to say, I was going to give them that the two the two numbers. This is three percent. This is eight percent. Why why don't uh, we just go the eight percent? Because a lot of people would like to go three <laughs> percent. I think right it now, was I like could pass seven it at four. At, at the at the moment, I could pass it at three, but I'm being respectful of those of you that that. Um, would like it to be eight. So it's, I'm being respectful to include that language of the three of you that want to keep it at eight. That doesn't, I don't know, that doesn't make sense to me because I thought it was kind of like seven, four, you know, going all the way up to three or keeping it at eight type deal. Because, you know, we got to, they're okay with 8% themselves. They said it already. Why, yeah. why can't we just do that? I think everyone's on board with the eight and then a few people want to go to three. And like you said, it's a few bucks, but if we need to give bucks. more money to the bucks board bucks. of education, every little bit helps. Okay. I, I hear you. We are going to have to move on because we've got CRF funds, which we're, we're dealing with multiple millions. Um, so I, I'm going to need to move us on. And Kathleen, did you ha have something related to this? because I've got to get us out of this pit. <laughs> okay, um, sure, are we moving on? I, yeah. I just wanted to clarify that I strongly prefer 3% because of the way we voted, it was could you live with or what do you prefer? And I just want to echo what Dylan said. These are, we're talking about 3000 bucks for one of our most at-risk categories of youth. So it was, could you live with, not what do you, what do you pick? So if, if we had had to rank, I definitely would have gone with the 3%. Larry. Can they raise $3,000 as a nonprofit? Can they go out to the street and raise $3,000? If they we're only raise, talking right. about $3,000, they can I think raise we're money. talking about $60,000. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to move us on because I've got people in the room and we have Phil that's leaving us in an hour and 10 minutes and we have to do all of our CRF funds. So I'm going to put the $3,000 question on the side right now. We can come back to it and I'm going to move us over to. So that Governor's Institute, they were cut by 5,700. They said they could live with it. So, I'd, okay, so they can live with that. The early literacy isn't attached to policy. As frustrated as we all are that that's just sitting there, it, to me, it's a wash. Can we live with accepting that? And the State Board of Education, we're waiting to get that testimony and we'll make a decision about that. Um, okay. Yep. All right. So let's move on to CRF where we're talking about millions and millions of dollars. Um, and I believe, oh no, I don't, we're going to do that. What time is it? I had Jim, I, Jim, can you, um, can you introduce our miscellaneous ed bill? And what we're going to do is just introduce it and we'll take testimony on it later. Of course. Um, so for the record, uh, Jim Damore, this console, we're going to walk through this uh, draft 1.1 of, uh, of your miscellaneous changes in education law to address COVID-19. Uh, I won't walk through all the language, but let's give you a sense of what's here. So section one, this is basically the secretary's recommendation um, as you've so far discussed it, uh, which is to uh, reduce the number of uh, school days from 175 to 170, that's section one. It, it does not reduce the in-service teacher days, which is another recommendation that the secretary made that you haven't gone with so far, so that's not here. So we'll um, hold that. So we can uh, we'll ask the um, V's about that going forward. And the second is just a technical change to include uh, the career technical center school districts uh, in the appropriation you made uh, earlier in June um, for uh, uh, pre-K through twelve. So that, that corrects that. Um, section three is the ADM provision. So this is uh, dealing with homeschool students and basically says that if you were counted last year, 
but now this year you're being homeschooled, you'll be counted this year as well. Um, section four is the secretary's recommendation on the Australian ballot. Uh, if you don't go so fast, please. Um, Phil, all right there, thank you. Um, section four um, would um, extend the, what you did earlier um, in at, let me see if it's on my screen here. Uh, last year, last session in act, um, 92, uh, you allowed school districts to use the Australian ballot uh, by way of a vote of the school board, as opposed to having to have a vote of the uh, voters. Or no. um, this extends that um, to the entire 2021 school year, because what you did in Act 92 was just for 2020 calendar year. But also, according to the, what the, um, the Secretary recommended, it would require school districts to uh, use Australian ballot. What you did in Act 92 was you allowed the school district to decide by, by the school board. So this changes, changes it possibly to a requirement. So that's a question more back to the agency. Do they really mean to have a state mandate on that? Or is it really just extending what you did last year a bit longer? So that's why that question mark is here on line 20, 19 and 20. Um, and then if you go down to section five, uh, scroll down further, if you would, Phil, um, right there, thanks. Uh, this waves, um, again, there's a question mark for AOE. Um, this waves the requirement that uh, a teacher have an, have an endorsement for online teaching. The question for the AOE is for what time period? They have proposed, um, for the 21-22 school year, but I wonder if they meant 2021. So that's the question for them. Session six is the language we passed numerous times before uh, dealing with vacancies on unified you know, unit school district boards. All we're doing here is extending what you've done twice before. Uh, further, if you go down to the uh, bottom of the page there, Phil, keep scrolling down. This is repealed on July 1, 2022. So it'd be in place another year and a half. Um, and uh, section seven is the effective date on passage. You're on mute. Uh, okay. So we will be taking a look at these items tomorrow. I'm hoping that we can move things forward. I think the only thing that really is the, the most controversial has to do with the um, the ADM, which we're going to be looking at on Friday with ways and means, the homeschooling. That discussion is the only one that may be a little bit tough to, to put into uh, the appropriations bill. So the school year, the career and tech centers, um, Australian ballot, the waiver on online teaching, and the elections of the Unified Union School District, all of which are uh, not large, but um, uh, helpful during this period of time. Um, and if you have questions, please feel free to, to send them to me and I'll make sure we have the right testimony coming in tomorrow. And I'm hoping that we can get that out of here uh, very quickly. <laughs> um, Tomorrow we will be hearing from the agency. There's possibility of agency in the room. They might be able to address some of that today as well, as well as um, the other usual suspects. Um, Secretary French, you are in the room at the moment, I believe, correct? He was in the room. I lost him, I guess. <laughs> Okay, so we'll wait on that um, then for tomorrow. <clears throat> so with that, we're gonna move on to um, the CRF funds. And I think uh, Mark Perot, are you able to help us get started with this? Or Chloe? Oops, there I am. Um, I, I, I could walk you through a little bit. I think that um, the school 
boards association and then the superintendents maybe make sense for them to go first but um okay. it's up to you i can great so we don't have a specific number that we know we're dealing with what we're looking at is is what is it that you think you're going to need what do you use and i i think brad james is brad james in the room today no okay so we'll look to the superintendents association um yep. And I, I can I can start you off with some background on how we got here. If it makes sense, would that help? Thank you. That would be helpful. Okay. okay. So so back back in the Q1 budget, um, the legislature appropriated um, fifty million dollars for um, K through twelve in the coronavirus relief funds that we had been allocated from the feds. Um, that money was um, put into a few boxes. Um, one of them was um, $12 million for the summer meals program. $29 million was made available for um, reimbursements to school districts for any CRF eligible costs that they could identify. Um, there was uh, um, $6.5 million for um, indoor air quality um, programs that went to Efficiency Vermont. And then there was a little bit of money for independent schools and some money for administration. Um, I, the focus, I think, today is on the, the $29 million that um, is going out to reimburse um, individual school districts for CRF eligible costs. Mm -hmm. At the time you appropriated this money, we recognized that we didn't have a very good handle on how much money um, school districts would actually need. So the legislature indicated that um, a portion of the remaining CRF money, about $100 million, would be reserved for use in August when you come back. So reserved for use now to provide any additional CRF money that school districts could use. Um, unfortunately, we, we don't have a really hard number there. Um, the Agency of Education sent out applications to districts last Friday um, and school districts are going to be um, ha having to submit their applications to AOE on Wednesday. Uh, I don't have any information on what that's looking like yet. But um, in an attempt to try to identify additional money that might be available, um, we've been working with the school boards association and the superintendents and districts to try to identify what their needs might be going forward. Um, there's needs that they've already um, spent money on or I know the big unknown is um, costs that they may um, not yet be aware of, of because the uh, under the CRF guidelines, money can be expended up until December 30th and still be eligible. So it's kind of an unknown. Um, the only other thing I wanted to throw out um, before talking about the estimate is um, out of the $12 million that you um, that the legislature had appropriated for summer meals program, because that money went out so late, districts were only able to use um, a little over $2 million of that money. And in the language that you passed um, regarding that, um, districts had to use the money up by the end of August. So there's about $10 million of money that was previously appropriated in that um, $50 million appropriation for summer meals. And the way the appropriation was done, it said up to $12 million could be used. And so since only two of it's been used, that other 10 actually becomes available for school districts to use as well. Um, I had a conversation this morning with um, Rosie Kruger over at AOE who runs a nutrition program. And AOE has indicated that school districts may be able to use four to $5 million of that money to pay for um, school meal equipment to provide. So, um, and uh, they thought that they could get that, that money out to districts pretty quickly. So that may be something you wanna consider as well. Um, but that still would leave an additional $5 million available. So um, unless you have any questions with that said, I'll stop there and um, hopefully Jeff and uh, Chelsea can talk a little bit about the information they've gotten from school boards. Or okay, so basically of the 12, five, only 2 million has been used and AOE yeah, has well, some ideas on, on how that might be able to be used to sort of continue on with that concept. Yes. Of it would, that would, it would require a language, some additional language, though, because the original language that appropriated it limited its use until until the end of August, which has gone by. So, okay, thank you. Yep. Um, I see the secretary in the room. Um, 
Secretary, would you like to speak to us on CRF recommendations or shall I go straight to the school boards? Uh, uh, good afternoon. Sorry, I've been, we had our press conference go very long today. Um, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Um, and Bill Bates, our CFO, is on as well. So we're, we can fill you in or if you have any specific questions or would you like a sort of a general update? Um, I missed the first part of Mark's comment, so I'm not sure. Yeah, a general update would be helpful. Bill, do you, want, on your end. Bill, do you want to walk through that? Absolutely. Can everyone hear me? Yes. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, for the record, Bill Bates, uh, Agency of Education, and uh, giving you an update on CRF. Breaking it down into its individual components, we received uh, an appropriation of $50 million, of which $12 million of that was uh, earmarked for summer food service program, 6.5 for Efficiency Vermont, LEA 29 million, and then approved independent schools was 1.5. And if you add that up, it comes to 49 and the remaining $1 million was for accounting support. And so quick update, uh, summer food service program, that uh, program ran from June through August and has been completed at this point. We are, uh, we, uh, Rosie has submitted her report to the legislature and also has been in touch with uh, Mark uh, regarding uh, how that program played out. Of the $12 million that was earmarked for the program, with, using round numbers, we're looking at uh, having expended $3 million, which leaves a balance of nine. And Rosie's report uh, will indicate that uh, there is about $4 million in equipment needs to prepare the meals. And then there's a question as to uh, whether or not the remaining $5 million might want to be used for uh, busing or other, other needs. So that's summer food. Efficiency Vermont, that was a $6.5 million uh, grant program where the agency of education worked with uh, Efficiency Vermont to get a, a grant uh, board agreement out to them. And then Efficiency Vermont, Vermont is going to be working directly with the individual LEAs. And the LEAs would then be uh, hiring local contractors to do that work. Um, LEA grant, so this is the $29 million. Um, again, this is running from March 1st to December 30. All of the uh, information has been sent out to the LEAs. And I just got off a call with a fiscal uh, guidance team, which is an internal team to the agency of Ed. We've already received seven applications in already on, uh, on that. So those, those uh, applications are coming in. And then on the independent school grant, that's $1.5 million. And uh, most up-to-date information is we've already received three of those. So of all of the LEAs, you've only had, you only have five, seven applications? So we, we just recently sent these out and uh, that was as of uh, Friday the 21st and we've already received seven in. Um, one, one wrinkle that I will share with the, uh, the group here is that uh, in the 11th hour, AOA and their uh, consulting firm Guidehouse reached out to us about uh, FEMA. And uh, so we have uh, worked with Guidehouse and AOA to send out a survey to the LEAs. And so Agency of Administration has asked that uh, the LEAs respond back by tomorrow as far as uh, possible FEMA interest and they've received 57 responses. So my thinking is that the business managers filled out the FEMA response first and then as soon as they've got that completed, they would be sending in a uh, response for the LEA grant. That would be a fast follow-up. That's, that's my gut. Okay. Thank you. Um, Jeff and Chelsea. 
and Sue. We're looking to you to find out what you what you see as the, the need going forward. Sure. Um, how's my audio today? Good. Okay. I'll speak slowly and hope that it stays. You know what? You might, um, you might Jeff, turn off your video. So, turn, Jeff, turn off your video because you're not coming. I'll do that. Yeah, thank you. Sure. Okay. 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 Um, so following Mark and Bill, I will tell you what the Superintendents Association has done in collaboration with VASBO in an effort to inform the General Assembly through the Joint Fiscal Office regarding the need. And as Bill pointed out, and Mark too, on August 21st, school districts were provided the Coronavirus Relief Fund grant program application. And the purpose of that application was to, for them to account for CRF eligible funds that they had expended for the period March 1st through June 30, and to predict their expenditures associated with COVID-19 response from July 1 to December 31st. On August 15th, when we learned that the so-called set aside by the General Assembly um, was in question, the so-called $100 million, um, I immediately asked school districts to start to estimate the dollar value that they would need. And the reason that I did was because I think that the expectation has been that school districts would do what they needed to do in order to honor health and safety guidelines and, shall we say, reopen school to the best of their ability. <clears throat> so our interest is in making sure that school districts are appropriately reimbursed for the investments that they are making real time in an emergency situation. Um, I was away last week for four days, and when I came back, Chelsea, who was holding down the fort, so to speak, while I was away, told me that she had been in regular conversations with the Joint Fiscal Office, who was eager to get our help in estimating a number. Um, so through work with the Joint Fiscal Office, principally Mark Peralt, but also in conversations with Steve Klein, the Superintendents Association with VASBO support reached out to school districts and asked them when they had the numbers that they would be providing to the AOE tomorrow, which is that September 2nd deadline that Bill spoke of, would they share them with us so that we could pass them on to the Joint Fiscal Office? And I'm going to talk about the process in a minute, but as of right now, we've heard from 20 out of 52 districts, and Chelsea is going to share with you what we've learned in terms of a cost per pupil. So she'll do that in a minute. In a way, well, in more than a way, it's unfortunate that the timeline for the General Assembly doesn't coincide with the timeline that was established by the AOE. And I think that this is inadvertent because by 4.30 tomorrow afternoon, we're gonna have a better number than we do right now. So I've had extensive conversations with the Joint Fiscal Office about that, and I understand the pressing need to move forward with the appropriations process. So we are willing can, per, participants to try to get you the number. Um, so we have a number that we'll share with you that we don't take responsibility for because it's reported to us by the districts 
Tomorrow afternoon, AOE will have information, but for some reason, they're not able to do a calculation that will tell you what they think it will be. Um, so the timing is off. The final thing I'll say, and then I'll turn it over to Chelsea to give you the information that we've collected, is that we're receiving what I would refer to as qualified responses. If you look at the application that the AOE put out, it goes into a lot of detail about what's an eligible cost. The problem is the school districts don't know what their costs will be because they don't know how the model might change from in-person to fully remote to hybrid based on what the, what the trajectory uh, of, or the pattern of the virus is. So, you know, you're doing the best we can, you can, we're doing the best we can. You're gonna allocate a number. We hope it's a good number, but it's all very, very flexible based on what happens with the virus. Do so remember with that, that all of this will go to the other, other body, so. Yeah, we know, we know. We, I mean, I understand all that. Steve, Steve Klein and I, I was on the phone with him at 20 minutes past seven this morning, and I was on the phone with Mark, I think it's seven o'clock last night or late. Um, but at any rate, I'm going to pass it over to Chelsea. She'll tell you what we collected right now. And the last thing I'll say is the AOE is going to be in possession itself of this information tomorrow. So Bill said seven people have submitted, but, I, but my belief is that 20, 20, seven districts have submitted. My belief is that 20 districts have completed their process because they have shared their numbers with us. So I'll pass this over to Chelsea who's actually been doing the data collection and the tally for us. So thanks, I'll answer questions after Chelsea speaks, if you'd like me to. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Chelsea Myers, for the record, uh, VSA. As Jeff said, 20 districts or, or single school districts or SUs reported out of 52. I'm saying 52 because originally the three tech, independent tech districts were not eligible for those funds. Um, at this point in time, we have uh, $675.95 per equalized pupil. That represents about uh, 32,000 pupils accounted for in those 20 districts. There, it's, I think, interesting to note that there was no, absolutely no correlation between district size and the spending per uh, equalized pupil. Um, I'm happy to ask any questions. And as Jeff said, um, there were qualifiers in some of these data points. Are you going to be able to submit any of this in writing as to Bill Bates as well, as well as um, Jeff and Chelsea? We like to look at things. <laughs> yeah, I mean, my, my preference on that, because, you know, I, I rarely do I feel uncomfortable and always are we willing to play a contributing role. We're, we're actually serving, we're doing this work on behalf of the Joint Fiscal Office. So Chelsea's sending reports almost on an hourly basis to Mark. We'll continue to do that. And then we wanna pass the information over to the JFO so that they can report it officially to the General Assembly. We don't, we truly are serving only as a conduit here. And I urge districts to try to complete their work early because I know you needed this information. So yes, we could give it to you in writing, but we would. my preference would be to give it to the um, JFO and have them pass it on. So you will do either. Mark and, Mark and Chloe, uh, will you be able to um, put this into a document that we could actually use? <laughs> yes, I, I, I can do that once I, I'll, I'll work with uh, Jeff and Chelsea to put something together, but just to put it into context for you, um, You've already got more than a third of um, districts that cover more than a third of the students, like 36% of the students are covering. So to the extent that that per pupil number is representative of the whole state, you'd be looking at about a $60 million, um, $60 million of CRF eligible costs. If you subtract out the 29 you've already appropriated, that leaves a little over, that, well, 60, it leaves over $31 million in additional money that school districts would need to re fully reimburse them for what we've been able to identify as CRF eligible costs. But um, I'd, I'd be happy to work with uh, Jeff and Chelsea and get you something in writing. That is close to a number I've been hearing. Um, mm -hmm. 
in, in the 30, 35 range. Correct. Right. And if you, you know, because um, as Jeff pointed out, I mean, school districts do not necessarily know the kind of expenditures that they're going to run into depending on how they operate. And so you might want to build a cushion into there. And that's, I think we've been talking about something like $35 million, but. That'd be great. And if we, uh, if, if we have, you know, some multiplier that we're using such as per pupil that's based on, on something would be also be very, very helpful. Right. Going forward. And again, I mean, if, if we were able to get more information um, based on the submissions from school boards, even if it hasn't been vetted by AOE, I think that would be helpful. But my understanding is the AOE is not going to be able to report back to the legislature until the 10th or 11th of September, which is getting pretty far into our process. Um, yeah, yeah. And it will be out of our hands at that point. Correct. Which, which we just have to understand. Um, Sue Soglowski, did you have anything to add on that? Um, just uh, just a couple things. Just um, wondering if that um, is still correct that the AOE is not able to provide any information for another ten or eleven days, um, and also um, do appreciate the discussion about the unknowns um, that we're going to be uh, confronting in the next few months. And um, as we've all seen, it, it's very hard to predict what the future holds throughout this um, crisis. And that um, building in a cushion, as Mark suggested, I think um, is a very prudent idea. Thank you. Um, Peter Conlon. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I, I didn't hear the number uh, that Chelsea gave uh, for per pupil. And I just wanted to hear yeah. that again. That's $675.95. Okay, thank you. And um, along this process, I've been very concerned about, um, and I asked about it last week, and there wasn't really a good time to give an answer, but I've been very concerned about um, the guidance that went out and then came back about compensatory and recovery services for students on IEPs. And I'm just curious, uh, Chelsea, if you happen to know if those estimated numbers included that guidance that that I know is is what was rescinded, or maybe the secretary could comment on the status of that guidance, but it, it was out there, which creates kind of a, a, a demand issue. Um, and I'm just wondering where that issue may have come into play with these numbers. Um, I do not know the answer to that. I suspect that they are not included in these figures, but I could be wrong. And I would defer to Tracy Sawyers at BCSEA to talk about what the estimated costs um, are for those services based on the work she's done with her membership. Um, maybe if I may, could ask the secretary to, yeah. to comment on the status of those of those um, of that guidance today. Yes, please. If I may, uh, Rep Representative Webb, this is Jeff. If I could just chime in on that briefly. You know, uh, Jeff Francis, could you wait one second? We just want to uh, hear. The status from the secretary on um, whether, whether that was pulled back or not. Are you talking, I, I think the question pertained to our July special ed guidance. Yes. Uh, yes, we're in the process of revising that. Um, the, a group of stakeholders, I, I wouldn't say it's special ed director, some folks from VCSEA and also uh, some superintendents, uh, expressed an opinion that the, the guidance from July should be revoked entirely. Um, that's not our position, uh, but we, we are trying to take their feedback and construct a better version of that. That version was produced on Friday. Um, it's my understanding it's being shared with that stakeholder group for feedback. Okay, and I don't think we have do you, Tracy in the room. Could I follow up on that for a second, Kate? Please, please do. Um, with the revised um, guidance that you might be putting out, do you foresee that having an impact on the estimated needs of districts um, that they're trying to calculate right now for CRF funding? 
uh, you know, it's it's you know we're it's hard with this sort of moment in time where we're pivoting between reopening costs and what are going to be the larger financial you know repercussions of this emergency. I don't see a large amount of reopening costs emerging yet relative to student support services. Um, I think, on the other hand, this can be one of our most costly areas uh, as we as the emergency goes on. So we're kind of at that pivot point. Um, I don't see the guidance necessarily being germane to reopening costs per se, but it certainly it starts to speak to uh, what will be um, recovery services, if you will, or dealing with the repercussions of the emergency on the impact on students and particularly their special ed programs. So this I guess I should have asked a basic question, and that is whether these compensatory and recovery services are CRF money eligible. Yeah, that's that's a tricky question too. I don't know um, if we can answer that today. There's certainly special ed eligible reimbursement, you know, from our own formula. Um, I'm not sure if Bill has an answer to that regarding, um, you know, our current CRF guidance. But you know, once again, we haven't finalized our approach to this yet, so it's almost a little premature uh, to answer a question when we haven't finalized our approach. I will say, you know, thank you very much. It was not our intention to create, um, you know, I don't think we did create a new sort of category of eligibility for service. That's how it was interpreted. Uh, but we're, you know, like every state in the country, we're in sort of uncharted territory. Um, my conclusion and our team's conclusion that um, a, a complete uh, retraction of this guidance isn't appropriate. And particularly, we were looking at guidance that was produced uh, from other states. Um, namely Maine and Wisconsin and, and how they put together models uh, for quote unquote recovery services. Um, and, you know, so this is a bit of uncharted territory. We want to be as responsive as possible, uh, but we also know um, that there's going to be some need for us to, to put a toe in the water, so to speak, on this. So uh, we'll see how this final version, uh, the feedback we get on it. But um, I think the first step is to produce the finalized guidance, and then we can go from there on CRF eligibility. But you know, the, the, what makes CRF so challenging, as you've already alluded to, is the type, time constraint. Thank you. And of course, we're dealing with, with compensatory education, which is a uh, federal right. Uh, at the same time, we also have an entire school community that likely shows regression in, in learning. All right. Any other questions at this point? So going forward, um, we are going to be needing, I may have to schedule another meeting for us on Thursday. Um, I, I've been given that opportunity to have another meeting on Thursday. I'm just looking at the number of things that, that we have on our schedule that we need to have finalized by Friday, if not Wednesday. Um, yes, Sarita? Um, I had written you, Kate, about um, just the days, if we cut back the days, five days out of the calendar, does that, how does that impact uh, teachers? Um, if they're planning on that, you know, so I don't know if this is a place to ask it. I didn't, Secretary French would know that or if it's a contractual issue. There, can, yeah, please go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah, I, d I don't believe it'll have a significant impact. Most districts currently, you know, because the state minimums are 180 days divided up with 175 minute, uh, minimum student days and five minimum teacher and service days. So all teacher contracts have at least that in it uh, for a total of 180 days. Uh, so certainly what we're trying to do here is to reallocate the days, but not disrupt the total that's uh, 180 days. I will say uh, many teacher contracts, in addition to the minimums, negotiate uh, other days or um, you know specifics around in-service days and so forth. So there might be a bit of a ripple effect that's really hard to anticipate, but I would think for the most part, um, it should be more or less benign, if not welcome. Um, so I think in the cases where there might be some inconsistency with the current settled agreement, I think districts because there's going to be interest, I think, in all parties implementing this. I think my, my 
conclusion is that there would, in the cases where it's inconsistent with the current agreement or needs clarification, folks would execute memorandums of understanding and, and work it out. It's kind of the pattern we're seeing right now with working condition language, which never anticipated pandemic. Um, so many, many local teacher associations are working with their administrators to negotiate memorandums of agreement outside of the contract just to cover the sort of temporary work environment. And um, we can continue with that discussion. We also have some time tomorrow to deal with it. So let's just hold for a minute because I want to make sure. I'm sorry, Jeff Francis, I interrupted you earlier. Did you have something you wanted to add about the compensatory ed? Um, let me apologize because I interrupted you, but thanks for the opportunity. Um, I, I was simply going to say, and I think Dan covered some of it, I don't think that the estimates that we're seeing on coronavirus relief funds, the grant program, which is what we're trying to calculate to get that per pupil number, would include the compensatory services amount for two reasons. One, that sort of happened outside of the direct costs that we're asking schools to estimate. And two, that I don't believe that the special ed administrators and the business managers right now are communicating in a way that would have had them calculate those costs, particularly because the application that was provided by the AOE to the business managers and superintendents did not include a reference to that, nor should it have. But it's instructive because, as Secretary French pointed out, we are in uncharted territory, and the costs to provide educational services are going to be both the costs that are articulated in that application and also the kinds of costs that school districts are going to incur because of compensatory services. So it's just a reminder that there's a tremendous fluidity to this that everybody's doing the best they can, but we're going to be revisiting through the fall what these costs actually are. And then when the General Assembly reconvenes in January, I, I know for a fact that it's going to be a very hot topic of conversation. So that, that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Other questions? I can actually, given who's in the room, um, we have about a half an hour more before we lose our, our, our ledge assistant. Um, I can open it up to questions related to CRF and I can open it up to questions related to our miscellaneous said bill. Um, Kathy James. I was just wondering if we had um, any kind of update on how the um, air quality program is going through Efficiency Vermont. I had, I had read that there had been a lot of applications. I wasn't sure how that was proceeding. I, I can start that, um, if that's all right, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, my, I haven't had direct communication with them. Uh, maybe Bill has, but um, what I'm hearing, of course, is tremendous demand uh, for these services and some of it. Um, you know, I think we knew that going into it, this would just be a, a placeholder more or less to address some of these concerns. I know there are several districts that um, their concerns around HVAC factored prominently into their decision to not offer in-person learning, you know. Um, but I think, you know, the needs out there, I think the program's running well, Efficiency Vermont is ideally situated, I think, you know, with their um, connections with contractors and their understanding of the education landscape to expedite as much as they can this approach but i i'm hearing that they're they're already seeing an increased need just in sort of the the narrow scope of this program as initially defined um not sure what that total amount is but i understand there is additional need to just implement the program as it was anticipated to be implemented um secretary french as we look at our our miscellaneous ed bill um, there are a couple of questions that we had in relation to um, your, the Australian ballot. And I'm not sure if you were in the room when um, Jim Demeray was going over that bill. But there are a couple of questions that we had. Um, can you pull up that bill, um, Phil? Section four. And um, Jim, you're you're available as well. I, I believe this was language um, 
This is section four of the bill. And this is uh, your request for Australian ballot. We weren't sure if you wanted to have it mandated or uh, to simply make it so that it was available for use. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't seen you. I'm looking at your language uh, for the first time. So if you, I'll just take a look at it. Um, And maybe Jim Damaray, you could help. Um, I think, I think the that you know the if you could scroll up for a second, the issue, um, you know, what we're trying to address, and I think you've captured it, is the um, you know essentially the the voting methodology, whether it's a floor vote or Australian ballot, is determined by the voters themselves. So we're anticipating, uh, particularly town meeting or school district annual meeting, um, for floor votes being difficult this year, this March. Uh, in, in particular, it would be challenging for those that are configured as floor votes to, to hold a special meeting in advance of the March meeting to change their voting methodology to Australian ballot. So we wanted to uh, address that concern. I think you've done that here um, by basically giving that authority to a school board, um, is how I'm reading it. Any school district may apply the Australian to any of us in admitting other by vote of its board. Um, so that, to me, would satisfy the need um, you know, that you're, you're basically creating a path for districts to do this absent needing to hold a district meeting, meaning the voters meeting to do this, which seemed to be a logistical obstacle. So by giving it to the school board, I think you've addressed the issue. And by giving the authority, we don't necessarily, we don't need to mandate it. We're giving them the authority. That's correct. To, yeah, you've, it wasn't necessarily an intention to mandate it other than the fact that we didn't want everyone to have to go through some process um, but I think this this resolves the issue. It, it puts in a place that um, allows them to address the issue. The board, um, it's uh, just yeah, it's not something they typically have the authority to do. So, um, Jim Demery, how does this compare to what we did in the bill in June? So this would be identical to it, um, except that the bill in June was for calendar year twenty twenty. So this extends that by approximately six months. Okay. So this takes us through the school year. Yep. Yep. Okay, thank you. Um, and school boards, do you have a thought on that? Yes, uh, it's, as Jim said, the same as uh, what was put in place temporarily uh, earlier in the year, um, just extends it. And um, the only other, the, a question um, that, that came up in my mind was um, whether the requirement for, um, or the, the waiving of the requirement for um, signatures, collection of signatures in order to get your name on the ballot whether that was also um, going to be waived. Is that what, are you proposing that? Well, it's certainly something um, to consider. That was done last spring as well. Okay. Kate, that's probably not an ed committee issue since that would, that would pertain to all candidates in March. True. Um, I can ask the, the chair. I, I'm not sure if they're, I'm not sure what they're doing at this point. I had originally looked at maybe moving this over to their, their shop, but um, we're going to keep it here in ours. Okay, so that's a question. Um, in terms of other things related to this bill, uh, in terms of even though I have you on board all to, to testify on this tomorrow, we might be able to use that time to address some of the uh, other issues before us. Um, the length of the school year, um, I believe we have the teachers in the room. Did I see the teachers? Did I see Jeff Fannin in the room? Guess not. Um, this was language that's come from just about everybody. This came from AOE, it came from the, from the school boards and the superintendents. So I'll just need to hear from the teachers on that. And there was the question that, that came up 
should it should it go further than this to talk about teachers days or is that better left uh, as a local issue? Um, school boards, as you do the negotiating. <laughs> I believe the secretary had recommended adding on uh, five days and that is not in this draft. Um, I have I I could give you some feedback tomorrow when I testify on on this if you would like. Okay, that would be great. Um, so, uh, Secretary French, um, the regional tech centers. The uh, it, these are the independent ones. Um, there was a question. They had been left out of of the definition that we had used when we um, gave funds to uh, independent schools. And a question remained about whether that was made up with the use of GEAR funds. And I've forgotten what that stands for. Governors, I don't know. Uh -huh. Governors uh, Education Emergency Relief. Yes, okay. Um, just to, to back up, I think I caught that last line of questioning on the calendar. Uh, I don't see, I don't have the language in front of me, but um, if you're proposing to um, reduce the number of student days, but not augment the professional development days, uh, just to reduce the student days, um, I'm not sure if that's what was being, I think that's what Sue mentioned. Um, I think that I think that would be con very disruptive in terms of contracts um, and require some reconsideration. Yeah, I see uh, length of school year. Um, so I, my proposal was to, to sort of keep it together at 180 days um, to reduce the teacher or student days by five, but add five to the, the teacher days. And that was a common concern expressed by many school districts that they wanted to have additional professional development days. Right. So I think the, the entire the 180 days is usually the basis of a con contract. So if you're seeking to um, impact that, that might have broader disruption than what I was referring to. Um, I would support keeping it whole at 180 days, which is shifting the numbers. In terms of the, the tech center, um, so you were, I think, you know, if I remember the correspondence, you were seeking to address the issue of tech centers. In particular, we have three that are standalone school districts, and, but don't qualify as LEAs for the purposes of CRF funding. Um, so one, uh, the governor, the GEAR fund or GEAR funding is about $4.4 million and the governor, governor has expressed an interest in directing those funds to support uh, tech centers uh, across the board, um, which would include these three, uh, but that's it's $4.4 million. So that's certainly one thing to consider. I think the other thing, um, I think the question was, could you uh, include them in your definition of an independent school? You had created a separate, uh, an appropriation for independent schools under CRF. Um, I think you could, and we went back and looked at our CRF guidance on this. You, you really have the authority uh, to do that if you wanted to. You could define independent schools and the three tech centers. You're going to provide this number of dollars. Uh, you know, as long as the expenses are CRF eligible expenses, uh, you have full authority to do that. So, so you have, you know, one, there is some going to be some gear act money flowing towards tech centers, I believe. Um, but 4.4 million is going to be spread across all. 13 centers and um, you could change how you approach your independent school language in, in the CRF uh, appropriation to include them if you wanted to. Okay, thank you. I think we're gonna save the rest of this for uh, tomorrow. We have people lined up to um, testify on that. I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna give Peter one more um, chance here as well. And then we do have a document from John Carroll, so. I just had a technical question uh, that yeah. sprung to mind. Uh, if um, if these three independent tech centers are not considered LEAs, does that mean they also don't qualify for ESSER money? Uh, that's correct. That's my understanding. All right. And does our legislation solve that in terms of ESSER as opposed to CRF? No, I think you know that was the intention of talking about this issue today. I think the the fact that Gear is going to send some money in the direction of tech centers, uh, because even when they are um, 
part of a district, they are then, you know, from the larger LEA, I'll take Rutland City as an example, uh, which has staff or technical center. Rutland City's an LEA for the purposes of ESSER and CRF, uh, but the tech center would share uh, how those funds get utilized along with all the other schools and district needs appropriately, perhaps. Um, but there's no discrete uh, strategy to address the unique needs of tech centers. So that's why the governor's expressed interest in allocating gear funds in that direction. I think right, in, the, in, in this are, situation in Rutland, um, these three the school are board. Standalones. Like Hannaford, yeah, aren't going to fall under any LEA categorization for ESSER. So they're, you know, they wouldn't receive that ESSER consideration that Rutland or Stafford would. Right. Thank you for clarifying. Thank you. That's helpful. So we'll look at that again tomorrow. Uh, we're going to be pulling that up. And so I'm going to ask committee to take a look at that. If you have people you want to hear from, I'd like to make sure that we've got that going because I, I need to get this through. Um, my intention would be likely to pull out the ADM language because that's actually going through a different committee. Likely going through a different committee. But we'll keep it in for now. Um, so we have feedback from John Carroll, who got uh, his information to us. So Phil, could you could you pull that up? Just a second. Secretary French, um, he spoke to us about a budget that they had, that the State Board of Ed had prepared. I don't know if you ever had a chance to see it. No, I haven't seen uh, their budget proposal. Okay, there was a request that maybe things go a little bit better in communicating those budgets in the future. Um, recognizing that Right now we're in the middle of a global pandemic and those communications are not as easy as they usually are. Um, so. I don't have John in here to walk us through this, but I think that it's fairly clear. <laughs> So we're looking at the left column is the original proposal. The eight, the middle one is the, the current one that we're looking at. And the third line is the state board, their, their proposed budget restatement. So is that it? Okay. Okay. Committee, what would you like to do? We've got basically about 10 minutes. Can we accept their 70,750 as opposed to the 56,845? Is there anybody- How would you like us to answer the question, Kate? Is there anybody that, is there anybody that would propose something different than the 70,750? Chris Meadows. What, what's the RETN contract? I think, I forget what it is. That's, Mark, does anyone know? That's for the filming of the board meetings. Um, that's the oh, cable okay. TV contract. Gotcha. And to, to the chair's point, um, I mean, we, a year or so ago, we broke out the state board budget from the agency's budget intentionally. So there isn't uh, gonna be necessarily communication or I would say coordination uh, our intention is to have the state board speak for its own budget. So I'm not, I'm, I'm happy to answer a clarifying question like our, our ETN because I know the answer, but I'm not okay. going to advocate for this one way or the other. I just, um, but you should, you should expect by design, if we keep this construct that the state board on its own uh, would prepare some sort of proposal. We can certainly bring that forward yeah. in our, our total proposal. But. Yeah, I think that, that we are probably going to take a look at that next year. Um, it certainly is something a discussion that was started but never quite never quite finished it got placed on our wall in march and that was that so is there anybody who would uh not like to to propose the seventy thousand seven fifty budget okay yes can i just ask a question kate yes um, Chris, i wanted to ask a very 
Hold on a second. Chris, did you have something first? No, Sarita can keep going. That's fine. Okay. Go ahead, Sarita. Are you sure, Chris? <laughs> You're I couldn't raise my hand. I couldn't find my hand. So. <laughs> okay. So, Secretary of French, I think the what I wanted to understand for the legal counsel, the $20,000, um, are you, is the agency, you know, it looked like that's what was taken out um, from the AOE, uh, from the from the state board. So I just wanted to hear your either rationale or understand your thinking for doing that. The, um, we had, you know, there hasn't been a lot of, um, uh, budgeting for legal expenses for the state board. I think that's a typical approach. Uh, we saw Act 46 in particular, uh, where the board, um, we ended up in a place where the board uh, couldn't necessarily be represented by the agency, you know, because the board had a unique role to play in that Act 46 process. So there were um, legal new legal costs experienced by the board to implement Act 46. And uh, when we were then coming out of that process, and I remember formulating the budget, and I was asked, do you see anything like that in the horizon for the board? Um, and I said, no, I don't, you know, Act 46, to my view, was an anomaly, both in terms of uh, process, but also in terms of legal costs for the board. But I think this does get to the heart of um, what is the role of the board and, and to what extent they require outside counsel as part of their uh, scope of responsibility. And I think you know, that's, I think, something for the chair and the board itself to defend or make a case for, uh, per se. So to the group again, is there anybody that would oppose me recommending the $70,750 budget? Okay, I'm seeing no. For, I'm not seeing anybody. Oh, I see one. <laughs> no, I just have a question. My question. Oh, question. Okay, Chris, yes. Um, I'm used to seeing, like, this is just the budget, you know, what AOE said and then what school board or state board said. Um, I'm kind of used to seeing actuals, like current year actuals, and then where they're going to end up. Because right now I'm just looking at numbers comparing two budgets. I don't see, you know, normally is legal counsel $60,000 a year? Is it $2,000 a year? This doesn't actually make it look like I can figure out if there's any more fat to trim, so to speak. Um, if I don't know where they are right now and where they're kind of going. It's a good point. I think th I think then often they relied on a legal counsel from the agency. Yeah, to the yeah. president, you know, our budget proposal has that. Uh, our budget proposal had the 56. So in the context of our larger presentation, which I think you've probably seen at this point, I forget. Um, you know, when we put the budget, our formal budget present presentation together, we go through all the actuals and so forth. This, my understanding is this presentation, since it has the chair's signature on the bottom, was created by the chair, so, uh, or the state board. Um, so they chose how to arrange this information. I'm sure if you asked for additional information, they'd be able to do that. And we're happy to work with them uh, if you needed a different portrayal of the numbers. So, so to that point, Secretary, if you guys have a contingency in your budget or if the state board needs legal counsel outside of your your ability, or is that what this 20,000 is for? Yeah, you're getting close to where I don't feel comfortable uh, yeah. advocating for this. I will say that, you know, we would act, use Act 46 as an example. Um, there was a conflict of interest essentially between, you know, if you remember the secretary of education had to create or propose a statewide plan for governance. And then the state board had to take that plan and act on it. So there was necessarily a conflict of interest between those two positions. Um, and it, it necessitated the state board to have its own counsel in that process. Uh, but that's in my view, an, an unusual situation typically uh, you know, the agency is well staffed from a legal perspective. We have five full time attorneys, uh, including one assistant attorney general. Uh, so we, you know, we manage our costs in that regard fairly well. So on, on that sense, just about the Act 46, where do they get the money for that attorney? Did it just come from you guys to be able to fill that void? 
No, they had some money in their regular, just working within the construct of a regular budget, you know, sort of contracted service. It wasn't necessarily tagged as outside legal counsel, but they had some flexibility in their budget uh, to address that issue. And again, this is just going through this year. We're, you know, it, it would be my intention if I'm back and I am chair that we are gonna take up a review of the whole State Board of Education, which would include answers to many of these questions. The question is, we just need to get through this year. Can we see them through this year with this budget that they see that they need that is $70,750 for the year? Is there anybody that would be against me proposing that budget to the to the appropriations committee? And I'd say raise your little blue hands if you're against that. Okay, I'll just say I just don't have the information based on these two budgets. So, I mean, if the decision's made, that's you know, someone's prerogative. But I just yeah. don't have the data here that I need to see. Okay, so I have I have uh, I basically have two I think that are, are saying that they're not ready, and I have we have eight minutes before we lose our ledge council our ledge support. So, Kate, can I? This is uh, Caleb. Yeah. Sorry, I don't have a blue hand today. Um, I'll, I, just a quick comment. You know, I I, I think that I, I'm not against that recommendation, but I do find, um, you know, knowing that I've advocated for outright Vermont and knowing that at the end of the day, the general fund is a bit of a zero sum game. I struggle to advocate for too many things without understanding how the seesaw tips in the other direction. And that's really the way I felt about our sort of endorsement of the 23.8 million for the, for the state colleges. I'll just leave it at that. It's just very, very hard when I know there's a hierarchy of needs and then I'm not being asked to assign something, you know, I'd like to fund all of it. You know, I think we all would, but I think it's just hard sometimes when we don't get to see, and I know that's the job of the Appropriations Committee. I just want to go on record as saying that's a, that's a struggle for me when asked these questions, and I'll just leave it at that, but uh, I, I realize the process is difficult. I, I couldn't agree with you more. This process is very, very challenging for all of us, and I know our committee really likes to, to make an informed decision, and we're struggling with that. At the same time, all we're doing is saying uh, making a recommendation, and the committee can take it or leave it because they're looking at they're looking at a whole uh, whole slew. Of, they've got the whole the whole thing, and there's money that's going to be moving around all over the place. So they're just looking for what would you recommend? And at the moment, we're we're not recommending much money. Um, we're the difference here is you know what is it fourteen fourteen thousand um, dollars? The difference with the other one was so, so we have we have less than less than I think fifty thousand or so that we're dealing with to recommend as an increase to the entire entire budget that was put forward. Um, okay, then I'm gonna I will I will I will put that in my my note, Larry Coopley. Did you have a question? No. Okay. No, I did not. Thank you, Kate. Okay. I, I don't know. My hand was up. Okay. And, um, okay. I just want to remind folks, well, no, I'm not going to, um, I think we're, think we've closed that one. <laughs> um, and then the last one is, and we've got, uh, four minutes before we have to go off. Uh, the last one would be, um, we're okay with Governor's Institute. We're accepting that they're losing money. We're accepting the seventy-nine thousand on the on the early. Oh, just quickly, um, Dan French. We're just so, so confused about that money. When, when was that money in that seventy-nine thousand for the early education? Or maybe you can even answer it tomorrow. Um, but we didn't we didn't understand that, and we're just struggling a little bit with how that relates to Equity yeah, It doesn't necessarily, other than thematically, they're on point. You know. Um, but my understanding, this this predates, this goes back some time. This money has not been spent for several years. Okay. At one point, it was attached to some initiative, uh, but that policy language doesn't exist anymore. So basically, we don't know how to spend the money. Um, so in a nutshell, that's my understanding of it. So as far as the outright Vermont, um, I'd like to propose that we do three and give them the wiggle room. <laughs> give the appropriations committee the room to to uh, reduce it to eight 
percent? You okay or not? I know I know that um, four are against that. Correct. That you want you're 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 stuck with the eight. You you want the eight and would go against the, the three. I love that we're talking two thousand dollars, Secretary French, and we're all in a tizzy about it. Whereas, you know, two hundred million, we're good. We're that's quick. Jay Hooper. Ah, oh, gosh, um, I'm okay with the three percent. I was compelled by uh, Kat's uh, testimony on the issue. Um, I agree with Dylan. You know, it's a it's a very worthwhile service. It's probably of all things to fully fund, that would be the entity to fully fund, particularly because it's just a couple thousand dollars. But um, how soon do we ha we have until tomorrow? Tomorrow to make all of our recommendations. Right? Yeah, that's the, I will send on for the other ones that we uh, the ones we're only speaking at this point for. Um, we're only speaking for outright and the state board. The rest of them we're, we're accepting. Hmm. So I just, I guess what I mean to say is I'm, I'm, I'm okay with whatever the committee ends up going for. Um, as I said, initially, I preferred the largest cut, but uh, you know, I think it's true. This is a, uh, an effective and important organization. And if we end up folding it, six all the way, then I'm happy with that too. Um, Secretary French, one thing that, that I, I still worry about is um, special education. You currently have some significant challenges with the federal government. Are you well enough staffed and supported to be able to address those challenges? Uh, you know, in terms of COVID, it's uncertain yet. I think we're uh, well staffed based on our previous requirements. You know, we're I think, as you're well aware, when I started, uh, we didn't have a state director, special ed, or a division director, or assistant division director. Um, they all retired in the same time frame. I think we're in a much better place now, but uh, it's. I still fully expect, under COVID, this to be our most challenging area in a lot of ways, uh, and it will put a significant demand on the agency's special ed team and our legal team and our finance team. Um, so, but I think we're not alone. If that's any consolation, I think all states are going to be challenged in this area. Mm -hmm. I think you're right. Okay, we're on for tomorrow. Um, Phil, thank you uh, so much for for staying with us today. Chip, I will send you something about what we have so far, and hope to get the outright sorted out tomorrow morning, or tomorrow. Um, can I just ask? Did you all have a discussion about? CRF, additional CRF funding? We and have. We, we are, we've started with that. Um, at the moment, it looks like uh, we're working with, with a number for the LEAs, um, and it looks like it's in the 30 range so far based on per pupil, needing to put in a, um, a, you know, a cushion. So we, we should be able, I'm hoping we can sort that out tomorrow. I'm sorry. I also know that um, we, we need to hear the University of Vermont. Well, I think the higher ed, I'll, I'll deal with with Bacon about that. Um, but we we basically have about oh I don't know maybe fifteen minutes of testimony on that 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 has been put forward and nothing in writing. So I've asked for them to sort of help justify uh, what this prediction is. Um, this is not easy. <laughs> Um, but it looks like we're going to have something that may be able to use uh, a per pupil spending, which could be a, a way to calculate um, how much is needed. Uh, and you, do you want that broken down or, or can you just leave it as this is what they're going to need for COVID related expenses? Um, well, I, I guess that, that'll really depend on your, what your proposal for the spending is. Um, yeah. But I think, the, the thing we need to know as early as possible, I mean, I understood that you all have a lot, a huge amount on your plate, um, you know, is the, is the total, what's the total going to be, how we right. put it in the budget, um, and what language needs to go around it will depend on what your proposal, you know, how, how that money is going to be spent. But, yeah. um, but I, I think that there's a little bit longer time frame, slightly longer, like a day longer. Yeah. for the CRF 
um, proposals to come to us. So if, if, if we have everything um, having to do with the general fund and the budget that you've just been talking about now, tomorrow, um, and the CRF spending proposal by Thursday. Mark and Chloe and, and Bill, will you be able to work on something for us so that we'll have something concrete to deal with? Like in about five minutes. Okay, right. weren't, weren't, weren't we told that in 24 hours, we yeah. should have uh, much more information to come up with that number? Right, thank so you. I think if we, can, if we can hold out till Thursday, that's gonna be very helpful. That would helpful. be really, really helpful. That's my understanding of what our committee's expecting from yeah. other committees. So um, 24 hours, um, yeah. It's a little more than five minutes. If you, if you folks could, if you folks could burn the midnight oil and come up with that, that would be very helpful. I know that you're waiting for information to come in. And with that, I think we need to go because our, um, our Phil needs to go start another meeting.